Hey everybody, we are live here in front of our beautiful log cabin with our chief preparator, George Brooks. George has been with the museum for 22 years and has uh, taken a little bit of time out of his day to tell us how we built this log cabin. This is a log cabin built or created rather by the artist Carl Unish. Um, the title of the piece is not just log cabin, it's called Slum Gullion, the Venerate Outpost. Uh, Slum Gullion, for those of you who don't know, and many of us certainly didn't when we heard that title for the first time, is some kind of uh, medieval stew, some kind of a soup. Um, something that you would eat that's hearty in a log cabin such as this, although we will see this is unlike any log cabin you've ever seen. So, George, um, when did we build this cabin? When, when, when did this happen? Oh, I mean, I don't even know how many years ago it was. It was such a long time. So, um, was it two years ago we built this? Wow, time flies. So it was like uh, the logs came. So the logs were delivered here, right? Correct. And they came how? Like on a big flatbed truck? A big flatbed truck. And, and the day they came, the morning was about 70 degrees. And as we were unloading the truck, a cold front came in with rain. So by the time we got done, we were like drenched. And the temperature was just above freezing. So I can't forget a day like that. So, and we had the logs for quite some time. They kind of sat in the parking lot over there. We were getting prepped to do the building. A lot of uh, prep work had to be done over here in the garden space. So people who may not see, um, we're across Crow Creek on the back side of the property here. Um, and this was a kind of undeveloped part of the gardens for the most part up yeah, till that point. The, part, uh, the only thing here was the fireplace and the vegetable garden. Yeah. And uh, plus a lot of the prep had to do with the foundation. We had to put in footings and columns. And as you can see, we had to raise this up because this is kind of a little floodplain. And often the creek will uh, breach and the water will get up here. So. so yeah, so you're saying, as people can see, the cabin was originally intended to be at ground level. Um, and what people will know from last year with the flooding that we had, Crow Creek right here floods pretty easily. One or two hours of hard rain and it's already yeah. going outside of its banks. So how do you deal with something like that? That was not part of the plan. You have to call an audible and change some stuff at the last second. How do you do that? Obviously, it's a beautiful solution. Um, did that kind of put everything on pause? Yes, it did. Uh, one, we had to get some estimates, find out like someone who was going to give us a good deal of the footing the way we wanted it. Uh, first, we talked about maybe doing a, a footing all along the wall. It was actually cheaper to put in these columns. And uh, most of the reinforced footing is underground. So those trenches have to be dug. The concrete had to be brought over in front end loaders in the parking lot because obviously the bridge won't hold the weight of a concrete truck. So, and then we had to wait for the stuff to cure before we could start building the cabin. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the outside for a second. So obviously it's a log cabin. In between each log, what, what do we have happening here? Well, normally on a log cabin you fill it up with a uh, form in handmade caulking called chinking. So they might stuck straw in there, mud. So what happened here is we uh, the artist installed tubing and then chinked it with ripped up fabric from like t-shirts so that he'd get these different colors. And then inside the tubing is of course LED lights. So yeah, so night, one thing people can't see is at night, this whole thing lights up in between each log, kind right. of this magical Multicolors. Yeah. Kind of looks a little like stained glass. Yeah. Kind of has a, you know, feels like something out of Willy Wonka or something. Right. Um, and then the roof, uh, you mentioned this fabric, might be hard to see right here. Let's maybe move over into the shadow a little bit here. Um, the roof is made, or at least tiled, with t shirts. Right. They've been soaked in a resin. So, um, so like those were all bent and then soaked in the resins, and then the other ones are like laid down, soaked in the resin. And then the uh, sub layer of the roof is actually half inch polycarbonate. So it's clear, it's weather resistant. And then you say weather resistant. So we just went through winter and a lot of rain. So is it holding up pretty well? Yeah, I mean, the material's made to hold up to like, I think it doesn't even start melting until 120 degrees and fully melts to close to 300 degrees. It's often used for sunroofs and uh, greenhouses. It's UV resistant. It can handle extreme cold, cold, so yeah. So, okay, so 
I think it was the summer of 2018, really spring summer 2018, when this really went into full building mode. Yeah, so it was very hot. It was a hot summer. What kind of crew did you have? Is it like you know two people, five people? Well, uh, and what were they doing? When we started out, we had maybe six or seven people working here. We had a couple working in the shop prepping the windows and the doors. Um, so we had at least three people almost any given time doing the chinking, which was a lot of work. They would have to soak little strips of rag in resin, wearing gloves, and then take little wires and then poke them in all these different little holes. They kind of remind me of the eye eyes creature from Madagascar, the little pointy fingers. And so um, it was better for them to wear like multi-layered gloves because once after a while the gloves would stick together, they would just peel them off and keep going. And then me and another gentleman was working on the roof, starting to do the uh, rafters. But it really got hot when we were finishing the roof. And, uh, and I recall lots of masks being worn because of the resin and such. Right. Yeah. So Respirators, people, people, yeah, it was it was, it was not unlike what's happening right now. Lots of masks yeah, right. happening. No windows were in there. We had fans going. We had a lot of circulation. Yeah. Uh, but once we started really on the roof, we were hitting triple digit temperatures. Drinking a lot of data rays. <laughs> so you, in some ways, are kind of like the general contractor of this project. The artist Carl was here a fair amount of time, kind of overseeing things. He was kind of making some of the windows and things on site, putting some things together. We kind of built out a little studio space for him yes. as a workshop. Um, did you hit any moments where you had to kind of pause? Were there any weather delays, or what were some of the bigger problems that you well, ran the into? Was it was an issue the whole time. Yeah. I mean, even when we finished the final stages, that year we had an earlier freeze. So we were literally working below freezing at the end, working in the hot heat. So, uh, and then uh, speaking of the, of the flood, there was a time where, well, when it rained, sometimes we got rained out. But one time the, we actually got flooded in. We had to wait an hour for the water to go down so we could get out. And then, like any project with an artist, is he has a vision that vision might change or evolve. So there were times where we'd have to like halt or maybe change something up or back step a little bit so that he could reach his final goal. Yeah, because sometimes you say, okay, this is maybe not possible. Here's a, here's a right. couple of offers of solutions and we'll see what's doing. Or just a new idea. Or, yeah, so maybe it'll look better if we added these beams or yeah. do this. Because we had renderings and we had all these things, but once you kind of get in there, it's always, it's like building a house or anything. It changes right. some. Um, why don't we go inside and look around because a lot of the really fan, fantastical fun parts are inside here. All right, so we're heading inside. One of the things you notice immediately is uh, this ceiling, which is filled with tons of these little lanterns, each one having a little kind of flickering LED light inside of it. Um, these were made from old bottles and whiskey bottles and Coca-Cola bottles. You can kind of see things, milk bottles. Um, Carl, the artist, made these um, with some of his team. Um, and then you got these windows, right? So. The windows are all stained glass. Most of the things that are inside the windows in terms of like uh, impressed in there or melted into the windows were things we gathered locally from doing a call. The windows came kind of at the very last part, obviously, because you wanted to protect them and not have them right. be around um, doing that. How, did you guys always know what windows were going in which spaces? Right. Well, more or less, Carl knew which ones were going on which places, because they're all, they, even though they might look like they're the same size, like these three, they're not. And uh, and then he had certain, if you look at them, each had kind of a theme going with them. So, um, well, this one's all clear glass, like trays and dishes and candy. There's, you know. Right, the, the bottles are pouring out. Yeah. Uh, and. They're functional windows. We had to frame them in. We had to make them. We actually do. Open. So this window actually opens. Yeah. Right, but we got locks on all of them. Yeah. Now I will say this too. This is a high tech cabin. We have AC and heat. We have security cameras for people, you know, not acting up in here. We have Wi-Fi, all that. Yes. But one thing you don't really see much of is kind of 
wires and technology everywhere. And I know that that was one of the things they wanted to keep hidden. Um, so you guys kind of came up with a fun solution. You want to show us a little bit of a uh, kind of, you know. Um, now we will say this, this is not for people to do themselves. Right, see that's an issue we're having right now is you can see the books are getting kind of torn from people pulling on yeah. the books all the time. So we'll have to have people promise. If you're watching out there, you have to promise never to attempt to do this because it's not meant to that. But we're going to show you a trick since you're at home. So behind these books, these books are all kind of cut in half, right? Right, and they're filled with wood. Some of them are, some of them aren't. And so when you open this, ta-da, what's in there? The LED transformer, the electricity for the, the building, we have a first aid kit. Um, this is where we put the padlocks when the cabin's open. Now I know that at one point, Carl, the artist, made a little compartment there that at one point was supposed to always have a bottle of bourbon in it. Well. Maybe not always, but. When he comes. Yeah, maybe that's the thing. When he comes to visit, we always make sure there's a bottle of bourbon in there for him. Um, so that really, you know, and actually people may not be able to hear this, but there's a certain hum and, and kind of the sound of electronics happening there that is masked by closing that door. So you don't have to kind of in, uh, have that interfere with your experience here. So yeah, was this a, difficult task trying to get everything put together in here? Uh, it was because we started adding more outlets and then plus we had run all the power, oh and the Wi-Fi, so it it all fits as you can see, but yeah. uh, the power comes up from underneath and runs basically up and over to power the lights and to give us uh, power for events. Yeah. Well, okay, so we'll close that up. And you guys, like I said, remember, no one's supposed to be playing with that. So you got a special treat seeing that today. Um, but that's not the only book thing we have in here. So as we go into this next room, one of the things that's really mind-blowing is a entire fireplace made completely out of books. Um, so I'll kind of have you go around there. This, these books were all donated locally also, so we did a call on social media and said, mm -hmm. if you have old books you'd like to contribute to this project, uh, you can do that. How did this thing get built? Uh, this was mostly Carl and one other person. I mean, Carl did most of it, the other person just basically helped. We had to drag the bandsaw down here and bring it here, and so uh, he tried a few test stacks in the studio, so he just ended up figuring out how to get them all to match. He would have to match books the same thickness. Um, yeah, and they're just all glued together. And then down there, there is a, it's not turned on right this second, yeah. but there's kind of a functioning uh, faux fireplace, right. which has a lot of broken pieces from other glass projects. And there's a kind of a spinning, almost like a lava lamp kind of thing in there that kind of gives the effect of a crackling right. fire. Um, so the most ornate window probably is this one. Yes, this is one of my favorites. Um, what, can, I, can you kind of point out a couple things that are in here? I think there's a railroad light, that big red yes, one. Yes, it's a railroad stop light. I mean, you got plates, ashtray. Um, there's a little stop light there, I think, in the middle. That's like from an actual like traffic light. Yes, it'd be a traffic light. You got the, the lid, the bowl. So the cutest thing. Yeah, this is like a little is, strawberry. You have these little doll set glassware. If you look, there's a little saucer. Oh yeah, like and these things. Here. Yes, and then there is, where was it? There's a little cup somewhere. <laughs> and then there, yeah, there's a thing in the corner right here. Yes, yeah. that's it. So yeah, I mean, this is pretty mind blowing uh, for a piece of stained glass. Um, we have had some discussions about covering them. So here's kind of a test where we have a, a piece of plexi in front of it to well, kind of see, you know, do we want to protect it or not? Well, right now there's a bench in front of it, but we've had little kids bump into it yeah. because it's, it goes down low. So and some of these things, I mean, they're three dimensional. They're coming off of there and have things that could snap right. off or break. So that's something we're thinking about a lot. Um, how about just some of a basic thing? All these benches and tables, were those all built here? No, actually Carl had, uh, had them built. I believe the gentleman was Amish and uh, this is supposed to be sassafras wood. So, so someone in the Amish community made these tables? Correct. Yeah, that's great. Um, when you got done with this project, 
after that long hot summer and we finally opened it in the fall of 2018 i believe uh -huh. um you know, what was that like? Was this probably one of the bigger undertakings you've done in your 22 years here? It was, yeah, it, was, it took about nine months to do this from the time that the lawns arrived until we finished. We finished like in shortly after festival started. Um, and we were working, a lot of times we were working 12 hours plus a day, every day of the week for months, right? So, and then also we had our other jobs to do, like change out, take down Museum Confidential, which was a big task. Yeah, so that, I mean, you, you know, because most people may not know this. I'll ask you a couple questions. Your job is called Chief Preparator. That's not a term people maybe hear often. No. That means you're kind of building everything that goes there. You're framing the things. Kind of tell us what, what are your duties as a Chief Preparator? So the reason for the word preparator is because I prepare exhibits. So... I'm an art handler, but also I have to do anything, anything to do with art, I have to do, deal with it. So if we're shipping art out on loan, I might have to build a crate, but I have to box it up. When we do an exhibit like Museum Confidential, we had a lot of build out. We had to actually build that giant bookcase, the motel lobby. Um, some shows we had to build a lot of pedestals. If you remember Native Fashion Now, that was his. Yeah, so people, people may not realize when a show comes from somewhere else even, the art is coming, but like the infrastructure and architecture of the show oftentimes, if not most times, is built here. Correct. Um, and that's one of the biggest labor components of, of the show. Um, now, we haven't built a ton of off-site structures outside here in the garden uh, like this. Um, so yeah, how did you kind of find that balance between you know what you had to do in the museum versus kind of finishing this project? Well, um, we just have to try and time it. Where okay, I need these people up there, so we're going to work on this. And um, so this project is like almost any other project of a living artist. Is I'm just supposed to work with them to help them achieve their goal. Um, I, I think Carl is watching right now, so well, I'll just throw this out while we're talking. Carl, if you have any questions for George, or you something I forgot to ask, please please shoot us a question. I'd love to hear hear what you think. Um, so yeah, I mean, have you gotten a chance to work with an artist for as closely in your time here as you got to do with Carl on this project? I, as closely, yes, but not for that length of time. So uh. yeah, yeah. Um, so. What about maintenance? You know, this thing's been here and finished for a year and a half. Um, has it been, you know, hard to kind of make sure things are kind of staying, you know, so far, you know, I mean, leaks? Like, I'll just talk, talk about some of the things you kind of have to deal with with weather and things changing. Yeah, so, um, so far, we've had to change out one of the power strips. Uh, we had one go bad. And of course, we have to check the light bulbs. We got light bulbs that have to be changed out. Um, but other than that, oh, every now and then I have to do something with one of the floorboards because um, a, a nail might work its way out. Yeah. So, um, one of the things we'll kind of go out here is we wanted to make sure that we had an accessible access to this. So, one of the things I don't know if remind me was this built after like when you were finished with this structure was it all happening at the same time this is a this is a full accessibility ramp for anyone with uh needs or wheelchair access needs you built this whole thing on here um which you know maybe not doesn't seem real complicated but this is a pretty large piece of uh uh add-on um so we had finished when we finished we had finished the two the front and back porch and stairs and then we decided we wanted to put it in a ramp so I basically had to disassemble part of this, extend it. So I had to move all the stairs and everything. Um, so a lot of people don't realize for every foot height you have for a space, you have 12 feet of ramp. 12 feet of ramp for every height off of the ground, you mean? Yeah. So that's why this had to be so long. And plus, once you reach a certain distance, uh, so many feet, you have to have a landing. The landing has to be a minimum of like five feet by five feet, so those wheelchairs can turn. Yeah, around. so ramp, flat space, more ramp down. Right. Yeah. So if we just built it straight out, it would have gone like 28 feet, you know. Right. And that was would have changed the whole aesthetic. So yeah. We, we came up with this design, and uh, 
it's functional. I think it looks nice. Well, good. And it's not the first thing you see when you come up to the cabin. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thanks for your work on this. It's one of our favorite things at the museum. And uh, all right. Thank you, George.